Hello and welcome back for our lectionary study here for this, this seventh week of Easter as we take a look at our first reading from, from this past Sunday, Acts 1, verses 12 to 26. And uh, as we prepare as this lead into, into Pentecost, um, this is one of those fascinating readings where not only we see the early church trying to figure out what to do with themselves, but um, also, you know, oh, there goes my coke, I had to open that one up. Um, also, as we uh, take a listen, really it's the first, um, what we would call within our, you know, our way of speaking, first call meeting, because um, Judas, who was one of the 12, basically became one that betrayed Jesus, and then he went out and hanged himself, and so, you know, what do we do? What do we do? And so we have to replace his number, and, and basically they they go through a process where they end up calling Matthias in order to take Judas's place on as one of the eyewitnesses. And it's interesting to hear as we, def uh, you know, dig into this. But as we begin, let's open again with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, um, grant us that dose of humility so that as we take a look at our own lives today that we don't think that we we are um, so so grand and so so wise within ourselves that we we cannot learn from the past and especially from those eyewitnesses of our Lord in his earthly ministry, of his death, of his resurrection, and even that ascension where he was taken back up into heaven. Continue to bless us with those open ears so that we, we learn to recognize not only our own pridefulness and the way it gets, it gets in the way, but more especially so that we can be drawn to grow in that spiritual sense um, where, where we grow and build upon that life which Christ has provided for us and that he gives us and calls us to through the waters of our baptism. All this we pray in his name. We say amen. All right, Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 12. Let me get my glasses on so I read properly. So here, Luke is recording, and it's the same Luke that wrote the gospel. And so Acts, and Luke and Acts are two parts of the same, um, same, same um, apostolic writer's um, eyewitness account of the life of Christ, and then his description of, um, and his account of the life of the early church. And both of these were written as a way to, to provide instruction for someone called Theophilus. And we're not quite sure whether that's um, an actual name of some sort of a Greek um, Greek kind of a, a dignitary that he's writing to in order to explain Christianity to a, a government official, or um, if Theophilus is simply what the, the Greek word means, um, where basically it's theos and phileo, a, a lover of God, um, one who, who loves God and so wants to really know and, 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 and dig themselves in. Okay. Um, you know, that's one of those things biblically where we have a little bit of, you know, discussion that can go back and forth and really doesn't amount to a hill of beans in terms of what the content of what the scriptures are. Um, it's just one of those interesting things. And in terms of one who loves God, basically one who is drawn into that love of God, these readings are good ones for us to work through as well. So starting at verse 12. Here Luke records, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem. So a Sabbath a Sabbath day's journey away. So in other words, um, according to Sabbath travel laws, it's not very far away because um, a regular day's journey is as how far you can travel within a day. But on the Sabbath, since there are restrictions on how far you ought to travel from your, your home, basically it's a short distance away um, from Jerusalem itself. So here they returned to Jerusalem, um, and when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. And so that upper room again, which we'll run into at Pentecost. Um, where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, not Judas Iscariot, okay? So here you've got the list of those 11 of the apostles who were left. And all these were, one, sorry, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to, and here's the fascinating thing, the Greek underneath says not simply prayer, the way that our um, English translations like to pick up so that, you know, from the 70s and into the 80s, you get the, the hippie expressions of Christianity where they just wandered around dancing with flowers and fields, praying and, and you know, the, the Jesus Christ superstar sort of an image. No, the, the actual word underneath is um, they were devoting themselves to the prayer. Okay, so 
um, and, and the the the, the um, definite article there, and it shows up in a few places the way Luke describes how they met for the prayers. Um, it, it points to the way in which the early church did follow an established um, liturgical um, set of prayers, similar to the way in which the Jewish community um, in the synagogues and as Christians met within the synagogues for the first, well, first century and into the opening decade of the second century, um, before they were kind of kicked out of the Jewish community, um, that they would meet together with the Jewish community for the prayers, because there were liturgical established set prayers that were used. So here, basically, it's this beautiful little little kind of a thing that we so often miss, but it's a very simple one. Um, here, the disciples, 50 days, this is really 50 days tying into Pentecost, um, 50 days after the resurrection are still using the prayers. Okay, so they're following a liturgical prayer format. I'm sorry to our, our um, non-liturgical friends who, who prefer to think that Christians just had this free-flowing kind of a, you know, following the spirit like like um, daddy lion seeds blowing in the wind sort of a thing. No, um, it was a very structured prayer life. Okay, so all these with one accord were devoting themselves to the prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Okay, and here the term brothers, again, that becomes one of those fascinating ones that people speculate out about. And then with the, uh, you know, the push over the last 40, 50 years to try and read through the Gnostic Gospels, which are remarkably later than the first century eyewitness accounts. We know from the language of the Greek, as well as from the type of manuscripts that were used, as well as from, you know, historical references. When did people know about these sorts of things, that they are not New Testament era. Okay, but people keep trying to think, well, maybe they were. Um, who are these brothers? And there's a couple of couple of ways that it's been explained with integrity. Okay, with integrity. Um, one is is that um, the language of Jesus and the early Jewish community would likely have been Aramaic. Um, and even though he lived within a, a Greek community and Hebrew was used within the synagogues just for day-to-day -day communications, Aramaic was used. Um, and so Aramaic still exists as a spoken language within a small community throughout um, the Middle East area, um, descendants of the Samaritans. And so here within, within um, the Aramaic usage to talk about the brothers simply to, it refers to extended families. So it could be cousins. It could also be brothers in the sense of um, the followers of Jesus. Okay. Um, the other explanation, which does have historical support too, is, is that um, Joseph had children from a previous marriage before um, he married um, Jesus' mother, Mary. And so um, Jesus would have had um, really what amounts to um, being stepbrothers. They're not half-brothers, stepbrothers, because Joseph isn't actual uh, biological father of Jesus, but stepbrothers. And so those would have been called brothers as well. And so um, both of those um, are, are reasonable explanations um, as we listen to all of this. But as we move forward, um, here again, the early church trying to figure out what they're doing, resurrection, they've seen Jesus ascend into heaven, now what? And so they're sitting there at the upper room, they're praying still together with the synagogue, which continued until you know roughly 110 AD, so uh, beginning of the second century. Um, at which point in time, you know, the, the Jewish community became um, particularly antagonistic towards the Christians, and they simply wanted to get rid of them, and so they started adding prayers into their prayer book, part of the prayers, which became a standard sort of a thing where they say, not only, you know, the, the good standard prayer practice for the morning, you still find it within the Jewish prayer books, is that um, as a man you would wake up, I thank you, um, thank you that you've not made me a woman, Okay, it's not a sexist thing, um, because the women would stand up and they would say, thank you that you have not made me a man, um, those sorts of things along the way. So it was going back and forth, but all of these kinds of things along the way so that they would basically um, begin the day with prayer, recognizing God, God's providence, God's prayer, God's presence, and who they were standing before God. But then they started to add this prayer saying, and I thank you that I am not a Nazarene, in other words, a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. And at that point in time, um, basically those who were followers of Christ 
um, could no longer honestly pray that prayer as a part of the Jewish prayer life, the prayers. And so um, you really saw the separation of, of the, the Christian church out of the Judaic community. Okay. But here at this point in time, um, it still would have been together. So, um, but here specifically on this day, you have the, the disciples of Christ, the 11 remaining disciples together with the women and the brothers of Jesus now, which uh, however this, uh, however you choose to, to read that one. Now in those days, okay, now Peter um, basically is, 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 is taking on a leadership kind of a role. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120. So about 120 disciples and followers and said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which, um, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. So notice, um, you know, he doesn't appeal just to history or to personal grudges or to personal thoughts. Basically, he says, you know, what happened with Judas betraying Christ, that was all part of the scriptures, and he's going to unfold that right away. And scripture had to be fulfilled. God's word had to be fulfilled, okay? And so, as, as much as we'd like to grumble against Judas, he's already received his reward in that sense. But at the same time, as we take a look at it, this is all something that the Holy Spirit had spoken before through the words of the prophets, and particularly here through David. Um, and, um, you know, what are we going to do now, basically, is the question. So, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So, he was one of us. Now, this man, he bought a field with the reward from his wickedness. So, Judas basically um, betrayed Jesus for 12 pieces of silver. After he realized what this all led to, rather than having a repentance that led to um, restoration and reconciliation, um, the grief basically took him. And as we hear now, what he did is he took those silver coins, bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, okay, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. So basically, um, sounds like he hung himself and basically his, his body burst open, his bowels gushed out. Wonderful kind of an image. Um, you know, um, yeah. Um, scripture is not always, um, does not sugarcoat things, okay? So Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus. In his grief, he buys this field, he hangs himself. Um, as he hangs himself, basically, his, his innards spill out all over the place. And as a result, and this goes back to the explanation that, that Luke is, is building here, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language, Akadama, that is the field of blood. Okay. So people, they, they understood the history, and so basically the name, um, it's like Three Tree Corner around Thorsby, Alberta. Why is it called Three Tree Corner? There used to be three trees there. Aren't there anymore. They were cut down many, many years ago, but it's still called Three Tree Corner, so that everybody that's grown up there calls it Three Tree Corner. Um, yeah, anyone that's new that moves into the area, they pick it up from the locals, and that, that's Three Tree Corner, even though there's no trees there anymore. But... There were at one point in time. So um, very much in the same way, basically, Judas hangs himself. He spills and gushes out his innards. His blood is spilt all over the land. As a result, that field that was bought with that money that he used, he gleaned from basically betraying Christ gets to be known as the field of blood because that's where his blood fell down. Okay, For it was written in the book of Psalms, may his camp... Now he goes back to David here, Peter says... So, for it was written in the book of Psalms about Judas Iscariot, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and, notice, let another take his office. So, basically, appealing to the scriptures, and he says, scriptures say, let another take his office, and so, we've got to replace him, we've got to fill that spot. So, verse 21, so one of the men, um, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Now note what the requirements are. 
Okay. First, you have to be with us the whole time. Whole time, what do you mean whole time? Well, from the time in which Jesus was baptized until he was taken up as a witness of the resurrection and then into heaven. So here becomes the foundation saying, we don't just want anybody. We don't just want someone that stands higher than the rest, like when they picked Saul as king. We don't want somebody who happens to be an eloquent speaker, even though he doesn't actually see there. The importance of the apostolic office right from the beginning was that these were eyewitnesses so that they could reliably go out and tell others, this is what happened. The same as we heard from John, where um, John in his letter basically says, you know, the world doesn't follow us because they don't accept our testimony. But, you know, those who are followers, those who are children of God, do accept our testimony, and our testimony is true. And so he's not patting himself on the back. He's basically appealing to this eyewitness testimony. So what happened here? Verse 23. So they put forward two, two names. Made a short list, okay, similar to a call meeting. So who do they call? Put on the short list. Joseph, called Barsabbas who was also called Justice. Interesting. So Joseph being, um, Barsabbas being an Aramaic name, uh, Bar being the, the Aramaic way of saying son of Sabas, um, and then Justice, a good Latin name. So you've got a Hebrew, an Aramaic, as well as a Latin name. Not uncommon. If you talk to Pastor Oboya Church, um, many of the people in the, the Anuak community, they have their Anuak name, they have an Amharic name quite often, because Amharic is the national language of Ethiopia, and then they'll often adopt an English name, so that depending on what context you're in, if you don't realize that that one person has three names, um, you might get yourself completely befuddled. But it, you know, it's a similar kind of a context. Multiple languages, multiple cultures, Hebrew, Aramaic, as well as a good Latin name. So you've got Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, the first person, and then Matthias. And they prayed and they said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. All of this is done in the context of the prayers during the liturgical service. Okay, interesting. They didn't say, okay, you get up and preach and you get up and preach and then we're going to try and compare and see, you know, which one do we like better? Do you suit our needs better? You know, na, 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 na. No, they said, here's the two names. Lord, you show us and you guide us and guide us in that selection. And then rather than voting, here's the fun part. You know, we're used to having voting at a voters meeting where we vote and, you know, put into place who we're going to call through a vote. Well, in this example here, they put the two men and the two names that they had brought forward into the hands of our good Lord and asked the Holy Spirit to guide them. And then what did they do? Verse 26, it says, and they cast lots for them and the lot fell on Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. In other words, they prayed, and then from what our perspective would be is they left it up to random chance. And so it's like tossing a dice, casting lots. Okay, which one, who gets it? And, um, you know, as we take a look at that, we're so accustomed in our own day and age to look at things like that as, as just so random because we think we have to control everything. And, and this this is part of the um, the way in which the democratic impulse has really um, it, you know distorted the way in which we take a look at church. And this is where so many denominations get in trouble because they take a look at the life of the church as what the will of God is through the will of the people, and so that we, you know. If we all vote and the majority of people say they want this, then that's what we have to do. And some things administratively, absolutely. But, you know, when it comes to what's the teaching, we don't vote on what the eyewitness apostles said happened with Jesus or what his teaching was. Instead, we receive that and we allow that to shape and form us. Because if we vote on and say, ah, maybe, maybe not, then really it isn't. God's word or the historic witness that we believe, but it's our own selves and the Jesus of our own making. 
and then we end up really making a mockery of what we call faith or even any kind of a, a spiritual tradition because if the spiritual tradition is just to follow what is popular culturally right now what's the difference and then you slap jesus name on top of it what's the difference between that and tony robbins or you know whatever other kind of a movement within society um you know the eyewitness accounts throughout the New Testament point to Jesus as the one who has died, the one who was raised from the dead, the one who ascended into heaven, who commanded us to go out and baptize and to teach repentance and forgiveness in his name and to bring that into the lives of people through the celebration of what we call the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, Eucharist, there's a few different words where Jesus comes to be truly present. Okay, And as we hear those sorts of things, the call for us is to trust. And that's what we see happened here, where Scripture says, as Peter preaches on that, that psalm, let another take his office. And so they bring two eyewitnesses that have been with them from the beginning to the end. And they basically say it's, well, Joseph and Matthias. Lord, you show us which one that you have appointed for this position. And they cast lots, trusting that the Lord will make the decision in his way and in his time. Um, imagine if we had, you know, a situation like that at a church convention to nominate and elect our um, our next president of synod, you know, those sorts of things. You know, what would people say? Um, knowing the climate and just watching how people interact just with even things like sound medical advice nowadays, um, you know, how everyone says, oh, how, you know, where's my control? Where's my control? Um, we have control issues. And um, coming to terms with that in light of a passage like this um, becomes very important for us, each and every one of us. Um, do we have a big heart for the church? Yes. Do we want to see the church um, be able to grow and extend and you know succeed in that sense and that's often that's a worldly category that we throw in there absolutely but but as we look at that you know we have to trust the lord in his leading rather than um simply always throwing ourselves in and micromanaging what we would like to see happen um because well you're not the holy spirit neither am i um, neither was Peter, neither is Matthias, neither was Joseph. But to trust that the Lord will work in and through, you know, these various means is a good thing. And so when things don't move as quickly, quickly as we like, um, you know, take a step back and say, Lord, help me, guide me, show me. Um, and in the same way, same thing with this pandemic. You know, it's very easy to get all befuddled and frustrated and up in arms about the things that we don't see happening, the things that we'd love to do, and then get caught up with all kinds of rhetoric where we think, oh, this is horrible, this is going to be forever. No, Ecclesiastes, there's a time and a season for everything. Sometimes the season lasts longer than what, you know, our old Adam self would prefer, but trust the Lord because... In the same way, the same Lord who created the world and formed this, the dry land and told the water so far and no further and all of those sorts of things, the same one who set the stars in their place in the skies, you know, he is the same one that has already um, set a limit to what's going on. And really right now, the call for us is to trust in him and to look to him. And as we listen to this particular passage and glean that out of this passage as well, um, to apply that to the whole of our life as the church so that as we take a look at what, what um, we are up to within our congregation, um, not to try and force the hand of the Holy Spirit, but instead um, to allow the Holy Spirit to not only cultivate our lives, as we butt up against perhaps our own egos, our own old Adam self, our own frustrations, but then also up against um, 
uh, you know, as, as we, we put our hands and our trust in the Lord, that he will unfold things in his own time, and that will be far better than what we can accomplish by our own force. All right, um, lots of words to say. But as, as we take a look at this and as we move into the, the day of Pentecost, here, again, building on Scripture, the liturgical context of the church, um, this, this um, you know, this trust in the Lord, which we so often lack. We say, I trust the Lord, but how come people aren't doing things as quickly as I'd like? They're not trusting the Lord as much as we, I, I think they should. Um, we, we insert ourselves too quickly. And um, rather than trying to insert ourselves and micromanage the church, and we, each and every one of us does it, okay? Preachers too, okay? Um, learn to trust the Lord, to love one another, another as Christ has loved us, to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us, and to serve in a responsive way to the mission opportunities that he's placed right at our doorstep. And that, too, is a part of this, this um, recording of the Book of Acts, the way Luke pieces it together, as the disciples were led from one place to the next, and the preaching of the gospel and the preaching of the word went. And the Holy Spirit did his work through the word, and often the disciples were surprised and amazed at what that work was and needed to be drawn in by the Holy Spirit and the testimony that the Holy Spirit gave. But for us, and as we see here, that message is one, trust the Lord, respond to what he's doing, allow your faith and our work together as a church to be dynamic along the way so that um, we don't get all caught up within rules and regulations and, you know, how things sometimes will work within council meetings. And then we end up having projects that either die on the table because it takes so long to address them or whatever it might be. Um, no, let's use the administrative structures. They're important in order to do the work that we need to do. But let's also be responsive to what that need is right in front of us rather than saying, oh, I don't know. Because, you know, the apostles, as they went out, they didn't say every step along the way, I don't know, better check with the other apostles. No, they simply went. And that dynamic and that flexibility becomes important for us even today as we look at not bending doctrine, no, but at being responsive with the strength, the mercy, the love, the grace, the forgiveness of Christ, as we care for those that the Lord has placed around us. May he strengthen us in that as we move forward. We are still not only an Easter church, but as we will see also a Pentecost church, because in the waters of baptism, as Peter preaches, we receive forgiveness of sins and the Holy Spirit. And for this, we give thanks to God and we say, Amen. Okay, we'll see you again. Bye for now.